Um, so this is going to be essentially the same talk I gave uh, on Saturday at the um, at the at the QRE workshops. If you were there, um, yeah, this is going to be the same thing essentially. Just so you're aware. Okay. So in this talk, I'm mostly going to focus on ZX calculus and what it is and what you can use it for, uh, with like the application content compilation in mind. But it's going to be mostly a tutorial. Okay, so the ZX Calculus is a graphical language for describing quantum computations, which was developed in 2007 by Bob Kuke and Ross Duncan. Ross Duncan, who is also here now in the, in the, in, at, this, at this conference. Uh, and it has been used in uh, quantum circuit optimization, uh, compilation, uh, measurement-based quantum computation, describing surface codes and data surgery, uh, but also quantum foundations and tensor networks and uh, yeah, lot, lot, lots of other stuff. Um, okay, so... Before I introduce LX, uh, and it's also just a convenient tool to do day-to-day -day reasoning about quantum circuits and quantum computations, which is also something I'm going to focus on in this talk. Uh, yeah, so uh, as, 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 uh, as it was just mentioned, uh, I wrote a sort of review article on ZX. So if after this talk you're interested and want to learn more, uh, you can check out uh, this paper of mine. Uh, and if you want an even longer introduction, I highly recommend this book written by Bob and Alex uh, about picturing quantum processes, which also covers ZX. Okay, so uh, to understand what ZX is, we first have to have to go over quantum circuits a bit. So this is this is just an example uh, quantum circuit, and we see we have the wires which go, which go from left to right, which all represents a qubit, and there's the gates that act on the qubit, and, and time flows from left to right. Uh, and of course, there's multiple quantum circuits that represent the same unitary, so there are certain identities there. So we can cancel to C not to to Hadamard, for instance. Uh, and there's also some non-trivial commutation, so there's, there's not a unique way to describe these things, even at the same time. Um, unfortunately, these are not the only identities you need. Uh, there's loads more identities, and there's even more identities, and there's even more identities. So it's like, it's a bit of a mess. So then the question is, like, why, why is this so terrible? Why can't it be nice? And the reason for that is that the choice of gates here is a bit arbitrary. So um, there's like many gates that are useful, but if you include all of them, then you need then you need rules that sort of in govern how each of these interact. So it's a bit complicated. Uh, the notation is not necessarily quantum native because this idea of circuits, of course, comes from logical circuits, which are a very classical thing. So it's kind of a coincidence that they would work at all to describe quantum computation. Um, and also uh, the wires are very rigid, like they go from left to right and it's the same number of inputs or outputs or you need to have ancillas but, or, or, or measurements, but they also have very strict rules on how to use them. And the ZX calculus essentially gets rid of these problems. Okay, so and on surface level, we can just uh, sort of gate by gate translate a circuit into a ZX diagram. So for instance, an S gate is a Z rotation, so we describe it by a green dot like this. And it's a, like a quarter rotation, so it's pi over 2 radians, so you write a pi over 2 here. Same way T gate is a, a Z rotation, so it's a green dot, but it's a, a, it's a 1 eighth rotation, so it's pi over 4 radians, so you write this. And then the X gate, well, that's a rotation over the X axis of the block sphere, so we write it in a, in a different color, in the, the red color. Um, and then the C naught, well, it's, it's described by this thing, and it will become clear why a bit later. And then we have a special notation for the Hadamard. And then we can just translate a circuit to ZX just gate-wise. We just take all these gates, and then we have a ZX diagram. OK, so why would you want to do this? So for instance, uh, we have this commutation rule that a T gate can go through the, through the control of a C naught. And this becomes this thing in ZX, which does not look easier on the, on, at first. But uh, the nice thing about this is that this is part of a sort of a pattern of rewrite rules. So this, uh, this rewrite rule comes from the fact that dots of the same color commute through each other. And that means that once you have this this, this single uh, sort of meta rule, we get and we get all the stuff for free. So, for instance, that the C naught gates, which have the target of the same qubit, um, that, that that's also the same color, so they commute through each other. And in fact, this is part of a pattern that's even more fundamental, which says that dots of the same color can just fuse together. So we have this thing on the right here, which is not does not correspond to any canonical quantum gate. But we can sort of see that it's now, it, it is sort of manifestly symmetric. So it obviously has this commutation here. Uh, it can, uh, ZX calculus can describe more than just uh, unitary gates. It can also describe states. So if we have these standard uh, states, uh, for instance, we have this identity, which says if you apply a zero to uh, the control of a C naught, well, that just that, that doesn't do anything. Whoa, what just happened? Um, so and what we can do is, um, this zero state is represented by this red dot with a single output. 
And then this is a part of a pattern that says that a single wire dot, so this dot has a single wire come out of it, it can copy through an opposite color dot. So it just copies through. And then here, for instance, we see we have two dots of the same color, so they fuse. And then this thing just an identity, so we can remove it. And again, the nice thing that is, is that uh, we get some other stuff for free because any rule in select calculus holds with the colors interchanged. So for instance, the plus state here is described by this green dot. And that means that if we apply the plus state to the target of a C knot, uh, it also does nothing. So we sort of get this rewrite rule in exactly the same way, we're just interchanging the colors. Okay, so with these examples uh, given, like, let me now give like a more formal introduction to what ZX diagrams are. So ZX diagrams are built out of spires. So whereas circuits are built out of gates, ZX diagrams are built out of spiders. And these spiders come in two different shapes. We have the green dot here, which is called a Z spider, and the red dot, which is called an X spider. And these can have any number of inputs or outputs, and they correspond to these particular linear maps. So these are sort of uh, like projectors to uh, the computational basis states, um, sort of like the Z spider, sort of a generalized Kronecker delta. So where you can see it together with a phase. And then the X spider is the same thing, but then uh, according to the basis of the X Pauli instead of the Z Pauli. And so, for instance, uh, if you have a single input, single output uh, spider, then we can sort of do the calculations, write them as a matrix, and we see that we get uh, the standard Z rotation over an angle alpha. So then this thing is the is a, is a Z rotation, okay, the unitary Z rotation. And the same way for the, the X spider, we can do the calculation and this corresponds to uh, a rotation over the X axis of the block sphere. Um, we have some special notation if the phase is zero, we just don't write a phase here, which is just a useful shorthand. And uh, yeah, just to give some more examples, um, we can build these sort of standard quantum states. So for instance, a red dot, well, it's just a plus state plus the minus state, and this is uh, up to a scalar factor, the zero states, in the same way for these other four combinations. Uh, the scalar factor is sort of a global scalar factor. And when we're dealing with unitaries, it, we usually don't care about this uh, because yeah, we could just keep track of it and we get a scalar at the end. Uh, but for many use cases, it's not necessary. When you're caring about specific amplitudes, of course, you do care about global scaling. But uh, yeah, in, in this talk, I'm just going to ignore that we have these global factors. Okay, so these spiders, we can compose them in two different ways. And the first way is using horizontal composition, which at the level, which, which at the level of the linear maps corresponds to just tensor products. So we have, for instance, this spider, which is this matrix, and we tensor it with an identity, and we get this bigger matrix here. And uh, just to give another example with an X spider, we get this big matrix here. And then we get to the other type of composition, which is horizontal composition. And this corresponds to the regular composition of linear maps. This is all just analogous to quantum circuits. There's nothing really special going on here. And we just have, we just multiply the matrix and we see we get this thing, which is uh, kind of like a C knot, but it has this global scalar factor. Um, okay, so, and then any ZX diagram is just built by taking these spiders and composing them using tensor products and, and, uh, and the horizontal comp composition. So any ZX diagram is built out of these ingredients. Uh, so a special thing is that these dots, uh, the spiders, they are uh, sort of symmetric tensors. And that means that this orientation of the wire here, so if we have this thing be an output here and an input here, or it's an output here and an input here, that doesn't matter. It gives you the same linear map. And that means that without loss of generality, we can write this as a, uh, as a horizontal wire. So this just means this thing or this thing, it doesn't matter, uh, which is why I wrote the C not in this way. Uh, generally, uh, only connectivity matters. So we can def we can arbitrarily deform a ZX diagram and it still represents the same linear map. So uh, yeah, these are all just connected in the same way. So the same linear map. What is important is we preserve the ordering of the inputs and outputs because otherwise we get a permutation of the qubits. So to summarize, uh, ZX diagrams are built out of two types of generators, the Z spiders and X spiders. They can be composed uh, horizontally and vertically, and we can build any ZX diagram that way. And we can wire uh, the, the we, we can connect them in any way we want. Uh, and yeah, it doesn't matter the topology of it, just what is connected to what. So how powerful is this as a representation? Well, it turns out that ZX diagrams are universal, which means that any linear map between qubits, so not just unitaries, can be represented as a ZX diagram. This also involves uh, post selection and states, for instance. Okay, so this is just notation. So there's better like 
um, yeah, so now we come to the actual sort of interesting part, namely what we can actually do with this notation. So what, what makes ZX, ZX calculus powerful is that they come with a set of rewrite rules. So this is a set uh, of ways in which we can transform a diagram just graphically while preserving the linear map, or at least preserving it up to global scalar. So I'm going to go into these real tools a bit in a bit more detail about what these things do and, and what sort of the intuition is behind them. So the most basic rule, so the fundamental rule, is spider fusion, which just says that if two spiders of the same color are connected, then we fuse them together. And we already saw a couple of examples of this, uh, namely the T gate that commutes through the target of a scene or to, through a control of a C knot. Uh, it's just sort of an, an instance of first spider fusion and then uh, doing the same weird rule in reverse. So sort of pushing it out the other end. And then also uh, the C knot that a knot gate can go to the target of a C knot. That's also an instance of spider fusion. And also that uh, two phase rotations of the same axis or two Z phase rotations that they compose together to make a larger rotation. That's also just spider fusion because you just add the phases together. Another useful weird rule is uh, these copy rules. So when we have a, a pi phase of the opposite color, we can sort of push it through the spider and it copies through all the other outputs and it uh, flips the phase. And when we have a state of the opposite color, we can also push it through and it sort of explodes in this way out, uh, out, 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 the, other end, out the other end. Um, I mean, we can combine rules together. So uh, for instance, if I want to look at this thing, well, I can first infuse the pi. So we're using spider fusion reverse, then pushing the pi through this to the spider, it comes here. Then I can explode this thing through this green spider. So I get this and then I fuse all these together. So then I see a sort of, I also get a copy rule for this other state because this red state here is a cat zero and this is a cat one. So these are sort of the computational basis states, which is why they copy through. And there's also some useful rewrite rules regarding the Hadamard. So we can define the Hadamard gate in terms of spiders, by just using its Euler decomposition or one of its Euler decompositions. And then there's two rules that are useful to uh, that are associated to it, namely that the Hadamar is self-inverse, so two Hadamars in a row cancels, and also that it's um, yeah it changes a Z spider uh, into an X spider under conjugation. So if he conjugates all the inputs and outputs of the Hadamar, it changes the color. Another way we can see this is that if we we can commute a Hadamar through a spider and it comes out the other end and it changes the color of the spider. So this is just a very sort of intuitive way of thinking about these Hadamards. Like you just think about pushing stuff through spiders. Yeah, and the consequence of these reward rules is that indeed all the things you can derive also holds with the colors reversed. So the final reward rule I want to discuss is a bit more complicated, but it's also a very powerful one. So for that, we need a bit of intuition from uh, the sort of linear maps that these spiders are. So this a pi state, if a is zero, this is a cat zero. And if a is one, this is a cat one. So this is sort of a way to encode a computational basis state if a is a Boolean variable. And we have this rewrite rule. So this sort of says that the Z spider acts as a copy gate. It copies this computational basis state through. And on the other hand, uh, the X spider sort of acts as an XOR gate. So it XORs these two uh, bits A and B together. And classically, we have this equation that uh, an XOR before a copy is the same thing as first doing copies and then XORs. And so that means we get the same rewrite rule in ZX calculus. So this is called the bi algebra rule. And it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a very useful type of thing because it allows you to commute spiders of opposite colors through each other. So to give an example of where we would use this, I'm going to show how uh, the three C not make a swap is proven in ZX or A proof. So first step is uh, deforming the diagram. So I'm not going to do any uh, graphical rewrite rule. I'm just going to uh, change the position of the spiders to make it more clear uh, which rewrite rule I'm applying next. Because now we recognize the right-hand side of the bioalgebra rule. So then I can apply the bioalgebra rule in reverse, and I get this thing. Then I deform the diagram again to make it a bit more, uh, more reasonable looking, and we get this thing. Now we can apply spider fusion. And now the next step is a rewrite rule I haven't introduced yet. It's the, called the Hoff rule. It allows you to disconnect pairs of wires from spiders of opposite colors. Uh, you can prove this using the rewrite rules I've shown so far. It's a bit of a, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky proof, but it's quite nice. But um, yeah, so now using this, we can sort of disconnect these two wires. And now these are just identities, so we can remove these identities and we are left with a swap. Okay, so to summarize, we have these rewrite tools for the ZX calculus. Uh, they hold any orientation, so the direction of the input and output wires is not important. 
And they also hold that the call is interchanged and they also hold that the phase is negated. So the phase is negated in this sense means that we take the conjugate of a linear maps. Okay. Uh, I, I want to add that this is a set of rewrite rules, which uh, is quite powerful, but it, it does not allow you to prove everything about linear maps. For that, you need some other rewrite rules, but uh, that won't be necessary in this talk, which you can find more details in my paper if you want. So, so get, let's give some examples from quantum computing. So uh, this circuit implements a GHZ state. So we can prove that this implements a GHZ state using ZX. So first step is just translating this circuit into a ZX diagram, which is just straightforward. Each of the elements is, straight, is translated directly. And then we see we have some spires of the same color that are connected. So let's just fuse them together. Now this thing on top and this thing on the bottom are just identities, so we can remove these dots. And again, we have spires of the same color, so we can fuse that together. We get this thing. Now this Hadamard can be pushed through this red dot and it changes color and there's nothing that the Hadamard can be pushed to, so it just disappears. And finally, we do one final spider fusion and we get a single spider and this indeed implements a GHZ state. For a second example, let me show this sort of standard teleportation protocol. So we have a bell state here and we have some classical, um, so we have some measurements or classical corrections and this allows LS to uh, transport its state to Bob. And we can prove that this works using ZX calculus. So here I've represented the measurement using this A pi. So this A is sort of uh, capturing the measurement outcome. So A is either zero or one, depending on measurement outcome. And then the classical corrections are just also, they have this value A. Um, this is just a way to represent uh, measurement and correction in ZX. Uh, there's also uh, different ways that show more directly the connections of how this information travels. But for now it will do. Uh, again, we have spiders of the same color, so we fuse them. We have a Hadamar, which you can push through, which changes the color. And again, we fuse a spider. Now we use the freedom to deform um, uh, diagrams arbitrarily. So here, the, this is also a nice feature of ZX. This bell state, it literally just looks like a cup. And we can just remove this cup by just deforming a diagram and then fusing the spiders. And then we realize that this thing doesn't do anything because either B is zero, in which case it's an identity, or B is two, in which case it's a two pi rotation, so it doesn't do anything. So we can just remove it. And again, we fuse spiders, and again, we remove. And we see that uh, literally what Alice puts in just gets transported to ball. Okay, so these were sort of uh, more uh, uh, sort of uh, yeah, simple examples. So let me now, let's now go to a bit more of an uh, involved uh, use case of ZX. So uh, probably many of you are familiar with, uh, with the gottesman canal theorem, which says that uh, if you have a quantum circuit consisting of just Clifford gates, then we can efficiently classically simulate it. Um, so what I want to show is that we can actually prove this using ZX, just, just entirely graphically, we can prove this result. So uh, first, a slightly more general thing. So we have Clifford unitaries, but I also define this thing a Clifford map. So this is any linear map which you can produce from Combining Clifford unitaries, Clifford states, so stabilizer states, and post selections. So these can be post selection to arbitrary uh, stabilizer states as well. Uh, and it turns out that a Clifford map can always be represented as a ZX diagram where all the phases are multiples of pi over 2. And conversely, any ZX diagram where the phases are multiples of pi over 2, uh, they are Clifford maps. Uh, and the reason for that is sort of because a C not gate, well, it doesn't involve any phases. An S gate, uh, it involves a pi over two phase, and a Hadamard at unit decomposition also consists of pi over two phases. So, um, yeah, and these generate all the Clifford unitaries. So that's kind of the reason for this. So then the goal is, um, yeah, to sort of understand better how these Clifford ZX diagrams work and how we can simplify them. So uh, first step is getting our diagrams to a more amenable form for sort of automated simplification. Because right now, they can be very sort of uh, weird looking things. Okay, so the first steps are to transform the ZX diagrams into graph-like diagrams, which are a bit better well-behaved. So first is uh, we transform all X spiders into Z spiders by pushing out Hadamard gates. Then we cancel adjacent Hadamard gates. And finally, we fuse all the spiders. And as a result, uh, all the spiders are only connected to each other via a Hadamard. Because if they were connected directly, they would, be, they would just fuse together. And then we can remove uh, the self loops. So we have this rear tool using a, from a uh, Hadamard self, self loop. And if we have a pair of connections, we can sort of remove these connections as a variation of the Hoff rule. Um, yeah, and then what we can do is uh, this Hadamard between a pair of spiders, instead of viewing this as sort of a separate generator or a separate vertex, I view it as more of a type of edge. Because then we have these vertices, these spiders, and edges in between them. And 
we call these graph-like because they are sort of um, yeah, they are simple undirected graphs with some additional phase data on the vertices and also some inputs and outputs. Uh, a special case of a graph-like diagram is a graph state. So uh, graph states are those graph-like diagrams that have no input spiders, where every spider is connected to a unique output and where all the phases are zero. Uh, and then there's like a very simple translation from a graph to a graph state, namely just each uh, vertex becomes a spider with an output and each edge becomes an Hadamard edge. So we just add a Hadamard between the spiders. Okay. And because we've transformed ZX diagrams to graphs, uh, we can view the rewrites in sort of a graph theoretical manner, which is quite useful. Uh, and one particular thing we need for that is this graph operation called local complementation. So uh, if I have a graph, a local complementation, or for instance, here around the vertex A, it looks at the neighborhood of A, and then it toggles the connectivity of it. So for instance, here B and D are connected. So then here, because B and D are both neighbors of A, we disconnect them. And here D and C are both neighbors of A and they are not connected, so we connect them. So we just toggle the connectivity. Uh, and a pivot is a particular sequence of local complementations, which uh, you do on a connected pair of vertices. And um, yeah, it's, 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 its action is that it's, uh, it swaps these two vertices and then it toggles the connectivity between three sets uh, of neighborhoods. So, so the exclusive neighborhood of V, the exclusive neighborhood of U and the, and the joint neighborhood of both of them. So it talks connectivity between these three groups. The reason I'm telling you this is because they uh, are implementable on graph states using local operations. So if I have a graph state, I can apply this combination of local Clifford operations. So an X rotation on the vertex I want to do local computation on, and then a S gate on each of its neighbors. And this exactly implements a local computation on the graph state. And similarly, by doing this three times, I can implement a pivot on a graph state. So uh, yeah, this is a bit harder Mars and pi phases. And we see, we get this swap between the U and V. And the nice thing about this in ZX is that there's variations on this that allow us to really simplify a diagram because this doesn't really have a simplification direction. It just toggles the connectivity of the graph. But if we have a vertex here, that is an internal vertex, so it's not connected to an input or, out or output, but it's only connected to other spiders, and it has a pi over two and minus pi over two phase, then I can remove it at the cost of complementing its neighborhood and changing the phases of the spiders in the neighborhood. Okay, so this diagram is now simpler because there's one less spider. And similarly, with a pivot, if I have a pair of spiders that are connected and have a zero or pi phase, so this J and K are zero and one, then I can remove this pair at the cost of uh, pivoting uh, the neighborhood. Okay, so this allows us to simplify these diagrams. In particular, using local computation just in sequence, we can remove all internal vertices that have a pi over two and minus pi over two phase. And using the pivot, we can remove all internal vertices with a zero or pi phase. Um, yeah, all connected vertices, but there's some variations on pivot that also allow you to uh, sort of get rid of other stuff. But remember that the Clifford ZX diagrams, well, all the phases are multiples of pi over two. So they either are plus pi over two, minus pi over two, or zero or pi. So using these rewrite rules, we can remove all internal uh, spiders. So we're only left with spiders that are connected to an input or output. But if the diagram does not have inputs or outputs, for instance, if it is an amplitude, so you have a uh, circuit and you composed it with uh, some states and some effect, well, then you have something which has no outputs, just represents a scalar, a complex number. That means that we've just removed all the spiders. So the entire diagram disappears. And uh, the reason for that is because I sort of ignored the scalar factors you get. But what you really get out is a scalar. You get a number out. So this means that just using these graph operations, we can calculate the amplitude. So we have an efficient calculation of amplitude algorithm, which gives us the, which gives us indeed the gottsman knoll theorem. Um, since every rewrite rule removes one spider, that's the linear amount of, of Real rules you need, and each real rule can only affect a quadratic number of, of things. So it's yeah, you get an efficient thing. Okay, another consequence is if we're not caring about a scalar diagrams, but actual circuits, is it removes all the internal spiders. So what we're left with is something which only has spiders on the boundary. So something that's connected to inputs, something that's connected to outputs. And I've drawn here this LC for local Clifford, which in this particular case would be a Hadamard followed by a possible uh, S gate or a Z gate or S dagger gate. 
So uh, infusing and doing some rewrite rules. What this gives us is a normal form for Clifford's. So this normal form in particular consists of layers. And the first layer is uh, Hadamard gate and S gate. So this is in this local computation here. And then a layer of CZ gate. Uh, then we get this parity circuit, which can be implemented using C not gates. And then a layer of Hadamars, a layer of CZ gates, and then a layer of S gates and Hadamard gates. And this is quite a nice normal form because it only has one layer of C nots. And that means that it's um, um, in some architectures or some designs, it's easier to implement or it requires less resource to implement than other normal forms. Uh, for instance, um, when trying to, when, when thinking about synthesizing for, uh, for um, like architectures that have limited connectivity, it's often easier to implement CZ layers than C not layers. So the fact that we have traded C not layers for CZ layers is quite beneficial. Um, and also in terms of asymptotic arguments, so there's uh, like um, uh, the number of parameters to specify this normal form is sort of asymptotically optimal. It shares that property with some other normal forms. Another nice thing is I don't know of any other way to get this normal form than through this select calculus. So, uh, there's many normal forms for Clifford, but I don't know of any that like matches this one just using symplectic matrices or something like that. Okay, so so far Clifford circuits. Uh, so let me say a bit more about uh, simplifying general circuits. So, for instance, if we have a general circuit which has non-Clifford phases, well, then we can't remove all internal spiders, and we get something that looks more complicated, so something like this. And in fact, it does not even look like a circuit anymore. So suppose we're trying to compile to a circuit, like using the simplification as an actual simplification of circuits. So how do we get a circuit out of this? Well, it turns out that all the rewrite rules are just described, so the local computation and pivoting. They preserve a property of the graph that's called G-flow. And uh, when we have a G flow, this, this tells us how to extract the circuit from it. It's a bit involved. You can check out these papers if you want to learn more. But uh, the crucial part is you, there, there's a way to do it and it's efficient. And you don't need Ancilla or stuff to do it. Uh, and so in this, this starts to give us an um, a, uh, optimization strategy for non Clifford phase. So trying to de decrease the T count, so the amount of uh, yeah, non Clifford stuff happening in the circuit. And uh, the crucial bit for that is uh, the usage of uh, phase gadgets. So this particular shape of ZX diagram, it's like this uh, spider connected to another spider via Hadamard gate. And this implements a particular type of unitary that uh, occurs a lot uh, in many types of circuits. And this is a very useful type of transformation. And there's a couple of rewrite tools associated to it. So there is this uh, var variation on pivoting that uh, so instead of deleting vertices, sort of conver converts a pair of vertices into a single phase gadget. Uh, which sort of creates the phase gadgets in the diagram. And then there's other thing that says that if we have two phase gadgets that are connected to the same set of spiders, then we can fuse them together. So if these things have a non-Clifford phase, well, these non-Clifford phases combine together. So then we, we remove at least one non-Clifford phase. And for instance, if these are both uh, T gates, well, then this becomes, an, uh, this becomes a sort of an S gate. So then it's Clifford and we can then remove the Clifford using the simplifications I described. So uh, this optimization strategy allows you to uh, kill non-Clifford phases. And uh, at the time when we, when we made this, uh, now a while back now, uh, this was actually improving on, on the state of the art for, for, for quite a few circuits. And, and we could combine it with some other methods to improve it for even more circuits. So this actually works quite well. Um, although there was a different paper in the same year uh, that uh, used a completely different method, but they achieved uh, essentially identical T count. So it's quite interesting that this completely different method method got the same count. So this sort of points towards this sort of being a canonical type of transformation, maybe. Uh, okay. So so far optimization. Um, so I want to say something about uh, equality verification. So how do you know these optimizations are actually correct? So we have a very simple strategy for that. So we we just take our optimized circuit. And we compose it with the adjoint of the original circuit. So if optimization was correct, then this resulting circuit should implement the identity. So then we just simplify the circuit. And if it reduces to the, to the identity, then we, there's some evidence that optimization was correct. If it doesn't reduce, well, then it's inconclusive. Um, that's the best we can do because the simplification runs in polynomial time, and this is a QMA hard problem. So it's only going to give you an answer in some of the cases. Um, the reason this uh, works well is because our uh, simplification strategy is sort of greedy in reducing the spiders, which means it takes a completely different path to, to sort of uh, diagram space when we just optimize a single circuit as when we're trying to sort of verify correctness here. So it's unlikely that an error would sort of cancel itself in this way. 
Um, and using this method, we actually found a mistake in, in another peer-reviewed optimizer. So we actually did find uh, like some error in some other work using this. Now, uh, I also wanted to say a little bit about uh, classical quantum circuit optimization. Um, um, sorry, uh, not optimization, uh, simulation, uh, but I think I've run out of time. So I'm just going to skip this bit. And uh, yeah, so there's, there's also some other stuff you can do with Sedex that I didn't talk about, like a CNOT optimization, uh, the relationship to measurement based quantum computation and letter surgery. Uh, circuit routing, there's some work on it, um, and some applications in tensor networks. Uh, I have a recent paper where we apply ZX to the study of a condensed matter system, and there's a paper in the works where we try to analyze uh, spin networks from, from loop quantum gravity. So, uh, yeah, hopefully something will come out of that. And, um, yeah, that's what I want to say. So, my conclusion is that ZX calculus is a uh, better representation of quantum circuits, um, and it allows you to graphically do many, to, to, to do many types of things. And... Uh, yeah, if you want to read more, uh, there's this paper I wrote, which contains many references to other works of Sedex, so that might be a good starting point to find those works. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. <laughs>